Marcin Stardavsky, Bauman on the 1967 to 68 anti Semitic campaign in Poland. In the midst of the anti Semitic campaign carried out by Poland's public authorities in March 1968, Zygmunt Bauman, along with other prominent professors, was charged with revisionism and Zionism. He was fired from his academic job and forced into exile as part of what became an exodus of 15 to 20,000 Jews. The talk will focus on Bauman's analysis of the anti-Semitic campaign, especially on his early exile publications and the link between them and his later more famous works. Dr. Marcin Stanavsky is an assistant professor at the University of Lower Silesia in Wrocław, Poland, where he teaches sociology and education. His research interests include nationalism, anti-Semitism, discrimination and their impact on identity and community, with particular focus on the historical sociology of Polish Jews after the Holocaust, anti-Semitism and post-1968 exodus. His major book is Socialization and Jewish Identity in Post-World War II Poland. And uh, to welcome everybody again to this event of the London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Anti-Semitism. Tonight we are um, very pleased to invite Marcin Stanowski to talk about his research on Zygmunt Bauman and Bauman's uh, response to the 1967-68 anti-Semitism campaign in Poland. Hi, Marcin. Okay, thank you, thank you, David. Uh, maybe I'll begin with somehow justifying uh, why it is worth rereading Bauman on uh, in Poland's late 1960s uh, anti-Semitism. Um, I'm going to focus uh, tonight on Bauman's sociological analysis of the events, not so much on biography or autobiography, although this renewed interest in Bauman, well, certainly in Poland recently, uh, came after publication of some biographic books, uh, especially two monumental volumes by Isabella Wagner and Artur Domosławski. I think Wagner's book actually was first published in English. Um, and in fact, Bauman's life is a rich and fascinating human story in itself. Uh, a window to use one of his metaphors on tragic, complex and enormously impactful history of the 20th century Poland in general and that of Polish Jews in particular. But I also believe that Bauman's writings on uh, the anti-Semitic campaign in Poland uh, deserve attention and discussion as sociological writings per se. So I thought that scrutinizing the, uh, his texts can in some way inform uh, the research that I'm currently involved uh, together with Anna Zawadzka and Piotr Forecki. I see they are both here. Uh, we're examining the impact of the campaign on Jews in Poland. My earlier research was on the post-1968 emigration exile. And currently we are more focused on the non-emigres. So my major purpose tonight is to explore and possibly also assess Bauman's analytical approach to the events that proved life-changing for him. Uh, before I move on to highlight Bauman's ideas as presented in his specific text, let me briefly outline the politics and impact of the campaign. This is always somehow a simplification, but the context is important. And in fact, what is referred to as March events or Polish March 1968 cannot and should not be reduced to anti-Semitic campaign only. There are several overlapping layers in the historical picture of the period. For several years preceding the campaign, there had been a growing dis dissatisfaction among members of the Polish United Workers Party, which was the ruling party in Poland, most notably uh, among non-Orthodox Marxist intellectuals who voiced their criticism on the party and government for failing the promises and hopes for more liberal and more humane version of socialism articulated during the de-Stalinization period in 1956 and shortly, shortly after. 
young generation uh, coming of age and entering universities in mid 1960s developed their own political cause, partly inspired by the party revisionists, but express, expressing aspirations for uh, great and greater freedoms, postulating changes in socioeconomic policies, predominantly calling for radical reforms within socialism, although at the time already some anti-socialist voices uh, were beginning to emerge. This young opposition erupted in March 1968 as a more immediate response to censorship. The authorities, uh, that is the, the, the party leadership and the security structures, that, that's very important, that were subject to the Ministry of Interior, responded to students' protests with violence and further legal repressions and launched an anti-revisionist operation that targeted also independent intellectuals and reform-oriented party members. This is when the government-sponsored uh, media undertook hatred campaign that used anti-Semitism as a significant tool to stigmatize and alienate the pro protesters. Meanwhile, the protests uh, at universities and also among non-university youth uh, spread across the country. The media and the party authorities, including the first secretary of the Central Committee, Władysław Gomułka, especially in his infamous speech on 19 March uh, 1968, targeted a Zionist plot of revisionists collaborating with international anti-socialist forces, most notably they mentioned Israel, uh, the US, West Germany, um, to corrupt the youth and destabilize the country. That was, that was the line. The Zionist motive was not new. Poland's authorities followed Soviet line uh, in fighting Zionism and rather uneasy relationships with Israel in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, these relations were somehow better than Soviet-Israeli relations in the, the 60s but uh, they ended with the breaking off the diplomatic ties in June 67 in response to Israel's victory in the Six Day War. Gomulka's first major contribution to anti-Zionist anti-Semitism occurred in fact in June 1967. On, on the 19th of June, there was uh, his speech at, the, uh, at a trade union Congress where he singled out Jews, calling them the fifth column in Poland for expressing pro-Israel sympathies. Uh, while there may be competing interpretations of whether Gomuka himself was an anti-Semite or merely wanted to keep control over the political situation using instruments he saw fit, the major force behind the, the campaign were people associated with a nationalist faction led by Mieczysław Moczar, the Minister of Interior. The faction was called Partisans and attracted those World War II veterans who fought in Nazi-occupied Poland, as opposed to those who came with the Polish troops and the Red Army from the Soviet Union, among whom were many Polish Jewish refugees. The partisans gained prominence in the mid-60s, not only within the ruling party, but also in influencing public debates on Poland's history and cultural politics, promoting patriotic and militarist spirit. Uh, Mocha's methods of police state invigilation, uh, the partisans' public presence, as well as the activity of the pro-communist Catholic organization PAX, that was led by a former, former meaning pre-World War II fascist, Bolesław Piasecki, prepared ground for radical nationalism to take over in 1968. Eventually, in the internal par party rivalry, Mochar was defeated, though he held offices in the subsequent years, and the anti-Zionist campaign slowed down to be halted in November 1968. This, however, did not change the predicament of the Jews. Many of them had already left Poland and more were to leave in the following years. Altogether, between 15 and 20,000 people left Poland. There are different estimates, but 15,000 would be uh, the, the lower estimates. Uh, they were purged from the party, fired from the jobs, expelled from universities, harassed at workplaces, schools, and in neighborhoods. This was indeed a coerced emigration and expulsion exacerbated by the very process of obtaining exit permits. People deciding to emigrate were forced to officially acknowledge their nationality as Jewish and were officially treated as going to Israel, then renounced their Polish citizenship, thus gaining stateless status, undergo humiliating procedures of handing over the apartments, paying the state 
back the costs of their children's university education and being excessively scrutinized by custom officers that the procedure was often uh, described as humiliating. Zygmunt Bauman and his family experienced all these aspects of anti-Semitic campaign. He himself became public enemy number one. His name repeated by the media propaganda and during party meetings, along with other academics accused of revisionism and Zionism, he was fired from the Warsaw University in late March 1968. His daughters were bullied at school. The family was under constant surveillance and harassment by the security services, in fact, for many years. Mm. And Bauman's family, uh, Bauman, Bauman's had family contacts in Israel, for example, that was one, one of the reasons, well, not, not the only one. Some people whom the Baumans had considered friends would turn away from them, and on a number of occasions they would receive phone calls from people overtly expressing antisemitism. And it was in this context that Bauman's exile took place and his early analysis of the March events emerged. I would now, now like to offer a brief discussion of Bauman's several texts uh, that deal with the March events more, more broadly and the anti-Semitic campaign uh, more specifically. Three of them are essays that Bauman published shortly after his expulsion from Poland. Uh, then one, uh, another mm, is an interview from the late 80s. And the last essay was written in the late 1990s, but published posthumously only five years ago. These are certainly not the only writings by Bauman on Jewish themes. There was a period from the late 1980s to the late 1990s that some scholars, Brian Shayet, for example, they, they call it Bauman's Jewish turn. Uh, when his major works such as Modernity and the Holocaust and Modernity and Ambivalence were published. Bauman's reflection on topics such as Jewish assimilation and its failure under normative structures of modern nation state and more broadly so-called garden culture can certainly be traced back to his thinking on and his lived experience of the anti-Semitic campaign in Poland. Still, explicit discussion of Poland's antisemitism of the late 1960s and its impact is confined to a handful of texts. Uh, the first text, uh, the, the first of the texts that I would like to uh, discuss is the article on frustration and the, and the conjurers, uh, the Polish title of, of Frustratio Kuglaza. It was published in Polish in December 1968 uh, in a, a Paris-based emigre journal, Kultura. Most of this article is a reflection on structural conditions and possible causes of the political crisis in 1968. Bauman says the campaign was a conjurer's attempt at avoiding to address historical problems. He explains why frustration arose in the Polish society, especially in the young post-war generation and points to the lack of egalitarianism, slowing down of the economic growth, uh, shrinking prospects for good jobs and good education and the process of re-emergence of the class structure in the mid-1960s, as well as factors such as censorship and the lack of freedom of expression, along with widespread denunciation and conformism. In sum, he points to uh, social and political contradictions of socialism, where virtually all social strata had reasons to be frustrated. That concerns also what he terms uh, the new middle class. Uh, this is quite an important term in, in, in his analysis. That is middle rank cadres, public officers, political and economic administrators, party functionaries, army officers. And this new middle class, uh, its depiction fits the profile somehow of the supporters of the partisan faction, this, this nationalist faction that I mentioned. And this new middle class was an important factor in the dynamics of the, of the anti-Semitic campaign. Bauman sees the campaign as a provocation by the authorities, the, the conjurers, to channel popular discontent in order to provide their own explanation of the country's problems. A populist move to expose the bankrupt political elites, cosmopolitan intellectuals, etc., and divert attention from real problems and legitimize repressions against the growing opposition. It is only towards the end of the article that the topic of antisemitism per se appears. 
Bauman employs here the concept of scapegoat, suggesting that instigators believe the society would respond positively and willingly to the blaming of the Jews. The Jews, says Bauman, were an ideal scapegoat, scapegoat because first, they were weak enough, a relatively small population without strong organization. Uh, second, they were strong enough. Defeating them would, quote, restore the sense of self-dignity and pride, and it would be a victory over an international conspiracy. And third, there was a quasi-logical uh, quasi or logical link between them and, as he says, the legitimate stereotype of the source of frustration, that is the link between Polish Jews and Soviet influence. Bauman claims that this antisemitism was invoked top down and was merely an instrument in the wider political strategy to destroy the opposition and gain support of the new middle class. While he notes that the low rank members of the party pushed towards continuing the struggle against Zionists, he interprets this as ineffectiveness of the campaign uh, as the structural issues remained unsolved. The second text, uh, also written in Polish, is Bauman's introduction to a collection of documents of the Polish students' movement of 1968 in a volume that was released in the following year, in 1969, by the same publisher, the, the Institut Literacki in Paris. This text is basically a reflection on the students' movement and as such provides an insightful contribution to, I would say, sociology of education, youth and revolt, including some remarks on similarities and differences of students' revolts in Eastern Europe and the West at, at the time. However, antisemitism is not discussed here except for a brief mention of the provocation by the authorities, the same as the, in the previous text, which was, quote, uh, richly seasoned with poisonous antisemitic sauce, attempting to present the class struggle and the struggle of ideas as the struggles of the Polish nation against foreign agents, unquote. Bauman briefly summarizes the postulates formulated uh, in the students' leaflets and pamphlets, noting their, quote, definition of the stage initiated by the Mochar group, the, the, the partisans, as a process of fascization of the country, unquote. Bauman certainly, certainly did not use the, anti, uh, the, the communism, anti-communism framework here. So his notification of a fascist aspect as opposed perhaps to socialist uh, ideas is not too surprising. But since the dominant framework uh, nowadays, I would say, uh, of thinking about the March events uh, tends to be anti-communist, this minor and somehow counterintuitive insight can be very inspiring for further research, and I will return to it um, towards the end of, uh, of my presentation. Then uh, the third text uh, is The End of Polish Jewry. Uh, that's, uh, that was published in English in the January 1969 in the issue of Bulletin on Soviet and East European Jewish Affairs, and this was an early period of the journal that, that, that is now titled East European Jewish Affairs. Um, this text, uh, I must say, stands out among these early writings uh, by Bauman because it deals much more directly with the situation of the Jews under attack in Poland. Bauman also uses stronger tone than in two Polish texts discussed earlier. The first section, for example, is titled Final Solution 1968 and discusses the anti-Semitic campaign characterized, quote, as almost fascist in its, in its style. So again, we have this reference to, 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 to fascist tropes, so to speak. He also emphasizes that the campaign took place merely a quarter of century after the Holocaust in a country that lost 90% of its Jewish citizens and that it em em emanated from, quote, a movement in which the majority of the Jews remaining in Poland had placed their hopes of a final eradication of all social and ideological reaction of which antisemitism had been a significant factor, unquote. Bauman restates the, that antisemitism was purely a political phenomenon, an instrument of appeal to the new middle class to handle their frustrations with presenting Jews as, as a scapegoat. Two other sections of the article are meant as a sociological outline of the situation of Polish Jewry in 1967-68, an attempt at preserving, uh, in Bauman's words, the image of this phenomenon just before its final disappearance. 
Bauman argues that Polish Jews after the war constituted with some exceptions, a largely assimilated population, especially after 1950. Therefore, the antisemitic campaign should be seen as an introduction by the authorities of, quote, racialist criteria in their definition of Jews, which to all intents and purposes recall the Nuremberg Clause, unquote. Uh, as the Jewish community was pushed outside the social and professional structure of Polish society, Bauman notes that, quote, the social status of Jews in Poland is mainly determined by their attitude towards and possibility of emigration. Other characteristics, says Bauman, such as age, educational qualifications, profession or income, are in the case of Polish Jews of importance only to the degree that they affect the main issue that is the problem of actual or potential emigration, unquote. Then he goes on to specify various categories of Jews in relation to their possibilities of emigrating or staying in Poland based on, based on these criteria. Um, that also includes so social networks and also uh, emotional, moral, and ideological attachment to the country. Bauman's analysis was published long before this wave of exile ended. That's January 1969, and the text was probably written late in the 1968. Uh, but this attempt at assessing short-term prospects of Jews in Poland certainly uh, deserves attention, in my opinion. Then we jump 20 years forward uh, to 1988, and the, four piece, the fourth piece that I, I'll just briefly mention is an interview that was published in Polish in a uh, in, in Poland in the underground. That, that's 1988. That's an interview titled Homecoming. There's an English title of, of, of this Polish interview. It was conducted by Anna Mieszczanek on the occasion of Bauman's first visit to Poland si since his emigration. And it, it, it is not really a systematic analysis of the March events. But what's interesting is that Bauman, uh, perhaps for the first time in print, uh, some, some of Bauman's personal account of the campaign was published. Uh, he responded to an explicit question, why did you leave Poland? Describing an unbearable atmosphere of, of anti-Semitism and so on. Uh, interestingly, he also mentions uh, that the experience of March 1968 in Poland, anti-Semitic campaign, uh, the whole pol political situation in exile made him rethink uh, sociology. This is maybe uh, a remark somewhat aside here, but, but I think it's interesting because that, that really echoes his book that was published a year before in 1987, Legislators and Interpreters, where he uh, he reflected on the changing role of in intellectuals. And the last text, uh, the, the last piece I would like to discuss is a paper that was <coughs> intended as a keynote speech at an international conference that was titled Communism, Catholicism, Antisemitism, the Exodus of Jews from Poland in 1968. And the conference was organized by the Munich University's Department of Jewish History and Culture in December 1998 to commemorate the 30th uh, anniversary of Poland's, Poland's uh, March events. Due to health problems, Bauman could not participate in the conference, and it was only in 2018 that the text was published in the thematic issue of the Münchner Beiträge zur Jüdischer uh, Geschichte und Kultur, edited by Daniel Mala and Evita Wiecki. Um, it is only on the final four pages of, uh, out of almost 30, that's, that's, a, that's a long essay, that the events in question are discussed. Bauman, however, provides some historical details such as the party documents from uh, March 1968, suggesting the positive reception of the party antisemitic politics among, quote, uh, working class and uh, the intelligentsia. Most of Bauman's analysis in Pawns in Other People's Games, that, that's the title of the essay, is informed by allosemitism, a concept that he borrowed from a Polish Jewish literary historian and critic, Arthur Sandauer. Bauman used the term allosemitism to discuss uh, ambivalence of the Jews and the idea and practice of maintaining Jews as, as different, setting them apart. Uh, 
whether in negative or, or positive terms uh, by the non-Jewish majority. In this article, which re repeats some of his earlier reflections, he used the concept of allosemitism to discuss the situation of Jews, mainly assimilating Jews in Polish social and cultural life from the late 19th century onwards, thus providing an in-depth and long-term interpretation of how and why antisemitism survived the Holocaust, was not eradicated in post-war uh, in post-war Poland, and eventually could be employed in the campaign of 1968. And let me quote Bauman from this text. The diverting of pressures arising from the urge of generational change at the uppermost and intermediate ranks of power and influence into the orthodox allo-Semitic channels in which the Jews were simul simultaneously omnipotent and contemptible had an added advantage of glossing over the inner faults and incongruities of the regime itself. The cause of the trouble was in but out, a cancerous growth in an essential healthy body. So these are the, the five, five texts uh, I wanted to discuss. Let me now uh, make some points on what I think is somehow debatable in, in, in these analyses. Maybe that, that's also a good starting point for a, for a later discussion. Um, so firstly, but, but, but really briefly, this provocation thesis that, that he articulated several times well, while the provocation was discussed among Polish oppositionists, uh, oppositionists in later years, in the late 70s, in the 1980s, when they were discussing what happened in 1968, and certain elements of provocation must have been at play, for sure, by the very logic of the police state. I think that the political dynamics uh, not only cannot be reduced to the provocation, but more recent research thoroughly analyzed the history of the democratic opposition and the March uh, movement as a genuine dissent. Uh, did Bauman emphasize the provocation, but at the same time, uh, he also analyzed the opposition movement as a serious actor and a pot potential agent of change can perhaps be seen as his uh, contradiction. The second point is the, the thesis of uh, on the instrumental role of antisemitism. Well, it is hard to deny this dimension, but I think uh, it would be too reductionist to say antisemitism was only a political instrument. I think a cultural aspect must be considered too, that is lasting patterns of antisemitism, the separation of Pole and Jew in popular consciousness, the durability of anti-Jewish stereotypes, the very strong framework of Jewish communism in anti-Semitism and etc. Perhaps allo-Semitism can be a helpful concept here. Um, and also a closer look at the Polish uh, society's attitudes might suggest not only that anti-Semitism was an instrument operated by the authorities and the media, but also that large sectors of the population wished to see this instrument upgraded and more effective and often acted upon this wish. One of our interviewees from the current project, uh, a person who was interviewed last year, uh, a person who, who never emigrated from Poland, expressed an opinion that she believed antisemitism had not been a cover up for the struggle over jobs or posts, but quote, quite the contrary. Antisemitism mm, was covered by the story that, that, that it was all about some posts. It was wild, pure, nationalist antisemitism. She, she said, and that's yeah, uh, and that's key, and that's your type, and that's yeah, was a pre World War II nationalist movement in Poland. Fascist, too, not, not merely nationalist. What is missing is in Baumann's account, uh, I think, is a thick description of antisemitism, to use this methodological term. Such a description could be based not only on archival sources that he cites uh, in his uh, later text, but also on memoirs and oral histories of the victims. This cannot, however, be a charge against Bauman's early analysis because such sources were not yet available at the time, that is around 1968-69. Uh, his paper from 1998 is better informed as to providing more insight into what happened 
but lacks more detailed aspects uh, of institutionalized and non-institutional anti-Semitic discrimination and violence. Then the third point is uh, about anti-Zionism. In Bauman's text, there is really no serious treatment of anti-Zionism as a policy that had both deeper roots than the 1967 crisis, and that was certainly inspired by the propaganda produced in the Soviet Union. And actually some scholars say that was a mutual inspiration uh, as far as anti-Zionism goes. The role of Soviet inspiration should not be overstated as Poland had its own propagandists, but there was, for example, Soviet anti-Zionist literature cir circulating in Polish translations. And certainly there was uh, a large degree of dependence uh, on the decisions made uh, by the Soviet Union as far as foreign policy towards Israel um, goes. And with this uh, is linked, somehow linked, uh, my fourth point mm, that is about Bauman's discussion of sociocultural dynamics among Polish Jews. Uh, while the article titled The End of Polish Jewry uh, provides valuable and thought provoking insights, Bauman seems to ignore Zionism as a real sentiment among Jews in Poland. Some older people, but also young post World War II generation. The party state authorities employed phantasmatic imagery of Zionist conspiracy that had no equivalent in, in reality and the hatred campaign and, and Zionist was a code word um, and the party purges and all kinds of discriminatory practices targeted people regardless of their actual view or position on Israel. Some of these people, however, actually had very positive feelings towards the Jewish state whether as a place where some of their relatives had emigrated uh, in previous decades or as their spiritual or ideological homeland. While there was no group that could uh, even symbolically be called a Zionist movement in the 1960s Poland and all the Zionist organizations ceased to exist just on the onset of Stalinism in the late 1940s, among the young generation, as I found in my earlier research, pro-Israeli sympathies were not infrequent Somewhat rebellious expressions of such sympathies would at times create tensions in Jewish schools or summer camps organized by the Secular Social and Cultural Association for the Jews uh, that was led by non-Zionist or anti-Zionist communists. Some young people uh, sought contacts with Israeli embassy even before uh, 1967. They would treat their interest in Israel as a demonstration of Jewish identification as well as a political position against the authoritarian regime that attempted, that attempted to marginalize and ultimately destroy this mode of identification. Anti-Zionism of the campaign was an um, anti-Semitic pattern as much as, for example, revealing one's Jewish ancestry and shaming people for being of Jewish origins and making the Pole-Jew distinction significant in public and private life. That is stig stigmatization mechanisms also found in earlier typically right-wing nationalist repertoire. It is a common interpretation uh, and it's a common uh, take by, by scholars that, that, that the campaign was officially Zionist, but in fact anti-Semitic. In fact, in, in, in Bauman's text, uh, the, the very same words uh, appear, but in fact anti-Semitic. But I think this this can be, or maybe should, maybe it should be reformulated that the campaign was anti-Semitic because it was anti-Zionist. And of course, for a number of other reasons. And the final point uh, that I see as debatable, and then I, I conclude with some maybe more positive remarks, uh, thinking about where Bauman's analysis can still inspire us. But the, 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 the fifth point uh, that, May, that, that may be good for, for discussing uh, is did the campaign of 1968 uh, really mark the end of Polish Jewry, as Bauman's uh, title in the article says. While the history of Polish Jews seemed truly coming to an end in 1968, and this was also a feeling expressed uh, by a Polish Jewish writer, Henrik Grinberg, around the, the same time also in the Paris journal uh, Kultura, 
within two decades, uh, a revival um, of Jewish life started. And in fact, throughout the 1970s and 1980s, uh, Jewish organizations continued to exist, of course, with very few people involved uh, and almost no people from the young generation. But there was uh, a revival of Jewish life uh, beginning in the late 1980s and certainly 1990s uh, that Bauman seems either barely taking notice of or just merely ignoring. In his 1998 pa paper, he wrote, uh, let me quote this, uh, where once Central European Jews lived, Jewish gravestones slowly disintegrate for the lack of grieving descendants of the dead. That, that is his only reference to the contemporary Poland at, at the time, late 19, uh, 1990s. Also, there was a remarkable reintegration of younger emigres in transnational networks after 1968. And we really need to uh, go beyond uh, what some scholars term methodological nationalism to acknowledge this, because that, that, that's really not associated with any particular nation state. Maybe uh, some particular feelings, positive feelings towards Israel, but it's a, really a transnational formation with the reunion, 68 gatherings, re renewal of community ties, people who knew themselves from the 1950s and 60s, from the Jewish summer camps, for example, friendships, as well as of renewal of ties and engagement with Poland. And just coming to, uh, to an end, uh, where Bauman's analysis can still inspire. I think there are several points. Let me, let me uh, discuss three. Uh, firstly, the remark on the fascization of the country and characterizing the anti-Semitic campaign as almost fascist. That was a brief remark, uh, but it should not be read, in my opinion, as a mere rhetorical gesture. But this can be treated as a more serious hypothesis that only partially had been dealt with by recent scholars. Few authors, uh, just a few authors, have made such direct references to fascism or the fascist type faction. For example, historian Felix Stich uh, discussing the, 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 the March 1968 and its impact. He, he also made a similar reference. While the thesis of nationalist legitimization of communist rule is not new, uh, and it's not, not particularly controversial, it would, be, uh, it would cer certainly be odd to call this rule fascist in the light of mainstream political science uh, typologies of systems and movements. But such an approach may still inform our understanding, for example, of so-called red-brown alliances in more contemporary history. Then the second point uh, that, that, that corresponds uh, with the first one is uh, about Bauman's focus on the new middle class uh, uh, as both an addressee of the campaign and its active agent. While researchers provided uh, great insight into political dynamics of anti-Semitism within structures of the party state bureaucracy, there's still a lot to explore in terms of populist impulses across social groups, the role of anti-Semitism in cementing political culture, mechanisms of socialization into anti-Semitism, et cetera. An, ana an analysis linking the class dynamics with culture, anti-Semitic discourse with anti-Semitic subjectivity, in all variants, traditional, modern nationalism, uh, not nationalist, anti-Zionist, related to communism, anti-communism, and to the Polish historical politics, uh, could cite Bauman as an inspiration. And I would say that we have a, a really um, good volumes of political history of anti-Semitism in 1968, but what's needed now is more of a social history of this anti-Semitism. And the final point uh, is Bauman's, uh, well, Bauman's discussion of positioning of the Jews remaining in Poland, their attitudes towards emigration uh, and non-emigration, their social potentials can inspire precisely what Bauman started. And this is from the point of view of, of my project with Anna and Piotr, a historical sociology of the Jews in Poland in the aftermath of the anti-Semitic campaign. Such a sociology should not only look at intergenerational di the di differences, but also intragenerational ones. It could discuss the role of specific localities 
and social spaces in shaping the experiences of the Jews, their strategies of responding to antisemitism, and their identity shifts as a result of antisemitic stigma. It can also explore their attitudes and roles in reviving Jewish life in Poland, and also in creating a larger, more, more contemporary civil society, including organizations and movements that take efforts at co containing and defeating current political forces that make the spirit of those shameful events of the past live on. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, thank you so much for that, Marcin. Um, I thought that was a really, really rich and interesting and uh, scholarly um, talk, actually, of, of some really um, profound research. Um, so thank you very, very much. And um, I think there's a lot to discuss uh, relevant to the talk. So um, I will open um, the floor up to questions um, and responses um, <clears throat> from the audience. And um, while people are having a think about that, um, maybe I will um, jump in with some themes and ideas of my own. Um, 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 there's one thing that, that really stood out for me in the talk um, and in what I've read of Zygmunt Bauman, I mean, the, the, what, I'm, what I've read of Bauman is mainly about his work on the Holocaust. Um, and it's this account of anti-Semitism as being something. So it, what I think came out in your talk really interestingly was, was this problem really about um, whether anti-Semitism is uh, just instrumental, is just a provocation, um, is just a political uh, tool, or whether, and then I was trying to articulate what the other possibility is, right? If it's not just a provocation or just a tool, what is it? Then it's in some sense authentic or, um, and I think you came to this when you talked about a the absence of a kind of thick description of anti-Semitism, of, of the, you know, the, the kind of anatomy of the exclusion um, that anti-Semitism becomes on a much more human level. And then also the relation to, to this, this word that I actually hadn't heard about uh, before, the, the allosemitism, is again, strikes me initially, immediately as a, as a kind of a wish to to pull back from anti-Semitism, to kind of downplay anti-Semitism, to say that anti-Semitism itself is on its way out, and actually the Jews themselves are on their way out, also because they are assimilating, and all of this is a kind of thing of, of that, that we would expect to have disappeared or to be disappearing, as perhaps his own Judaism was disappearing. I mean, I'm quite interested also in coming to um, issues of biography, but perhaps I'll leave that a little uh, till a little later. But also, of course, how do you explain the Holocaust? The Holocaust is explained by modernity, uh, kind of fundamentally. It's it's um, not explained in, in the first place by anti-Semitism as, as any kind of a genuine force, but uh, modernity. And of course, this idea of modernity then poses the question about, um, it's interesting because in your description, he talks about the contradictions of socialism and how kind of socialism was was uh, having trouble here and there in this point and that point. And, and then, but then also about a fascist, fascistization of communism. And I was wondering really whether communism wasn't already a largely fascistized, <laughs> system um and so so then we have in my head the idea of the focus on modernity being a way of kind of eliding things together in a way that perhaps uh he didn't really want to look at explicitly anyway i that's a huge question and also i don't expect you to kind of address it all in one go because you've you've done your work 
already and I hope other people will um, uh, kind of participate in a discussion but um, is there anything so there shall I shall I respond now or maybe we can we can take a couple more comments and questions if there are any who's um, ready um, well maybe if you'd uh, comment on any any of that that you that you might find useful or interesting um, and uh, yeah, uh, so maybe about allosemitism. Yeah, I have similar intuitions about the term that it's, uh, as you said, a pullback from antisemitism. Although I think Bauman's intention is to provide a broader framework that could explain antisemitism. Uh, I wonder whether he would use the term uh upon writing modernity and the holocaust because he certainly uh got to know uh the the sundower's book it, it, it's actually a, a small book published in early 80s in, in in poland where where this where this term is introduced and it, it's not analyzed uh very extensively but uh but it appears there mm. I don't know. Maybe maybe Bauman would introduce allosemitism to his analysis of the Holocaust. Uh, although that would somehow contradict his uh, his other reflection that it was somehow contingent uh, that the Holocaust happened to the Jews. Yes, uh, that the ideology could be different. That it's, uh, as you said, that, that that that's the mechanism and the logic of modernity that, that explains what happened, not any particular ideology. So, so there is some interesting uh, tension or maybe even contradiction here. Um, your question or your comment on instrumental versus something else. Uh, yes, well, certainly. Uh, cultural patterns, long-lasting cultural or long durée, the long-lasting mm. uh, cultural log logic of antisemitism. Uh, my colleague Anna Zawadzka, who, who, who is here, uh, is, is currently working on the book that will be published, uh, so published soon, uh, which is precisely about that, uh, the, the antisemitic patterns as, as, as cultural patterns. And especially the the, the 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 Jewish communists. Yeah, maybe we're, we're always being it. we're always being asked, aren't we, about um, this or that uh, example of anti-Semitism? Uh, you know, this thing that somebody has said or this thing that somebody has done is anti-Semitic, but are they are they an anti-Semite? And and perhaps that's a way into this distinction that Bauman wants to say somehow that there is this anti-Semitism and it's being mobilized instrumentally but no one is really an anti-semite no one either they're kind of pretending or they're putting it out there for instrumental reasons but but so this distinction i think between a kind of really a real and an authentic anti-semitism on the one hand and this kind of not real and not authentic anti-semitism which um happens to be the instrument through which modernity throws up or happens to be the instrument which Poland throws up. Yeah, yeah, but then there, there, there's this question between uh, 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 the, the question of, of the relationship between anti-Semitic cultural patterns that are not just momentary, that, that they are long lasting, uh, they, 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 they can be transforming and what I call anti-Semitic uh, subjectivity or anti-Semitic consciousness. Maybe, maybe it's that uh, it, it's activated, but it's out there. It's, it's out there in, the, in, in cultural resources, in, in the ways history is narrated, for example, yeah. in the yeah. way uh, national identity or national dignity uh, is built up. In fact, uh, in contemporary Poland, uh, what is what is what is called uh, historical politics? That, that is the way uh, the history, especially the history of the Holocaust, how it's how it's being told. These patterns resembled very much what uh, the authorities uh, were doing in 1968. 
So, you know, I think it, then if the government or, the, or certain parts of the elite are um, putting an anti-Semitism out there for instrumental reasons, in order for that to work, there must be a kind of so-called authentic anti-Semitism which it can rely on to to mobilize uh, because if it was a uh, if it was just made up uh, a, a kind of random you know uh something that that didn't that didn't resonate it wouldn't work yeah. right yes yeah, yeah I, I i completely agree about about that <laughs> well, people should be warned that I think I think I Anna is, uh, is raising hand. questions to ask. That uh, if people don't take the space, Anna, um, you're very welcome. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, thank you, Martin, for your presentation. Um, I must say it's also super refreshing for me to to hear about Bauman's reflection on March uh, 68. Um, in a way that. Um, Mm, I think I, um, because we, because I participate in the same research project uh, uh, with, with you, um, and because I'm thinking more and more about the particular uh, group of of Polish Jews as a, as a kind of a generation. Um, I now I, I think after your presentation I <clears throat> I. Be, I understand a bit more um, how can you um, perceive Bauman on this map? Because um, I think um, it's not a coincidence that Bauman used the term um, uh, created by Sandauer because they are they were both communists. They were both from uh, the same. Um, let's say model of assimilation which was true communism and i think um i understand bauman as a as an intellectual and as a person also uh, um uh, as a member of this very specific particular uh, uh generation or or uh, um or milieu which was over after 68 and which was uh, this uh, generation of universalists and I think allosemitism as a category, I also share uh, your objections, David, and, and yours, Marcin. I don't like this term, but I think this term um, uh, created by Sandauer uh, is the term that could be created only by the universalists, because it's the mm -hmm. term about like you <clears throat> that you treat Jews separately. You you just take them out of the of the mage of the of the whole society and you treat them or you perceive them differently. And this was precisely what this generation of Jewish communists didn't like didn't want to do anymore. Like this was exactly the the they were what was they were fighting against. So <clears throat> I would say that with March sixty eight, it's uh, it's also like I perceive my March sixty eight now as the as um, among other things, as the moment of the end of this uh, uh, of this project of this huge universalist project of assimilation of the Polish Jewish communists, and uh, the the Jewish revival, the so-called Jewish revival that Marcin mentioned, which started afterwards in seventies and eighties, was based like the this the Jewish revival offered new Jewish identities, but, but based on something completely different, but based more on the on the identity politics or this idea of difference. And this, uh, I think this was the, this is exactly what also Bauman was struggling always when he was coming back to Poland or when he was, uh, he was uh, um, asked by some journalists about his past and about his Jewishness and so on, because he didn't want to be perceived as Jews and, and not because he, did, he, he wanted to say he's not a Jew, he's not a Jew, 
but this was this this is this contradiction in in uh, uh, or this is this impossible um condition they have to they had to deal with in poland that they always had to deal with this with the fact that they were perceived as jewish but they didn't they didn't they didn't have this identity but also they didn't want to deny that they are jewish you know and this um and i think this is really uh, this is also the the pattern of a jewish of, of a polish culture that it, it in polish culture it's impossible to embrace all this together that either you are jewish or you're polish and i i, I think it's one of the like one of the effects of March also that this kind of a shape of a culture that you are either Jewish or Polish completely won that time and it was really like a def the, the defeat of this universalist communist project of Jewishness and uh, uh, including the, the, the personal identities we also struggle with this um, subject during our interviews that we are because now we together with Marcin and Piotr we are doing interviews with with Jews who, are, who stayed in Poland after 68 and a lot of them who are from the older gener like the people who are older the, the persons from former generations sometimes they are uh, quite suspicious and distant to us at the beginning because they are afraid that we are framing them into Jewishness, although they don't have this identity. So it's super important to them that we say, no, it's not because I perceive you as a Jewish person. You will tell me who are you. And of course, I'm not going to impose on you your identity. It's only because the society perceived you as a Jewish person. And that's why you were uh, uh, victimized. But this is this is super important difference uh, for our responders, and I think we need to also like respect that because this is the very intimate uh, question of their own identities. Yeah, just just uh, about Bauman, uh, what, what you said. I, I I don't have this book with the interview. It's, it's somewhere behind me. Uh, the, the, the homecoming interview, because the, uh, he says there explicitly that it was after the anti-Semitic campaign and his exile that he started uh, really. Well, at, at one point he said uh, he says that 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 he started really uh, being interested in in Jewishness, Jewish history, Jewish topics. Yes, but he also says that he. Mm, the, before 1968 that he felt both uh, a Jew and a Pole and he says something that uh, there was a place in Poland for traditional Jews Jewish Jews yeah so to speak uh, which I'm not sure was really the case in 1968 uh, and that, 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 that there was place for people who denied their Jewishness but that there was no place uh, for people like Bauman, that, that's what he says, who felt both Polish and Jewish. But in a way, uh, li li like you said, Anya, mm -hmm. uh, that you feel uh, Jewish, but not necessarily uh, declare this identification. Would it be too provocative? To the outside world. Would, Sorry? Would it be too provocative to say, that, that there's something in this concept which which is a kind of expression of frustration from from the the, the communist assimilationist Jews who say look we've assimilated we've done everything the anti-semites almost reasonably asked us to do we've done everything and still there's this allosemitism which prevents us from assimilating, which prevents us actually from disappearing, which which maintains uh, a, a, a different, which maintains us as different. Yeah. Yeah, and this can be uh, what Anna just said uh, about, yeah, for example, journalists asking Bauman uh, about his Jewishness, that he really uh, he really didn't want to talk about, uh, although he wrote about it, he wrote an autobiographic essay uh, titled uh, Poles, Jews and Me. And I think that the, the, the book based on this essay will be published uh, soon, uh, edited by, by Isabella Wagner also. Uh, so this was an important subject for him personally, 
but he didn't want to share with the public. So maybe this, this notion of allosemitism, although it's nowhere articulated as, as overtly, maybe it's, a, it's his response or his tool to also deal with the interest, which is not anti-Semitic in nature, certainly, uh, but it's this singling out, it's this marking the difference. I mean, that, that would be my interpretation. You mentioned, did you mention that, no, I may, may have got it confused in my head, that this was for him an, an anti-Semitism, was it um, an anti-Semitism which erupts at the end of anti-Semitism or an anti-Semitism which erupts at the end of Judaism or both, that it's a kind of like, we thought we'd gone beyond all of this and here, here it is kind of reasserting itself. Or did I make that up completely from your... I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh... I thought there was a, a, something about um, the idea that 68 was an anti-Semitism when anti-Semitism should have been obsolete, something of the past. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, he wrote in this, in this uh, English text, uh, that it was, well, yeah, that, that the campaign was shocking for the Jewish community in Poland. Well, firstly, because it happened, well, less than a quarter of a century after the Holocaust. Yeah. And secondly, because it emanated from the movement, meaning the communist movement or socialist movement, yes, the, 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 generally the left-wing movement that was supposed to eradicate anti-Semitism along with other uh, forms of injustice. Yes. And, and was there also a comment about this being an attack on Jews just as Jews were becoming themselves less Jewish or, or, or were becoming more assimilated or less? Yes, because that, that's how Bauman saw uh, the Jewish community uh, in the 50s and, and, and the 60s in Poland as largely assimilated. Uh, and I would say this was, uh, well, for the most part, this, this was a right picture. Certainly about young generation, uh, but still, I mean, there would also be too much of a simplification to, 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 yeah. to say, because what does assimilating really mean? Yeah. I mean, this was I mean, going, going to schools, going to state schools with... Uh, with the same curriculum uh, throughout the country. And even Jewish schools were, were secular schools. There, there were only two subjects, uh, Jewish history and Yiddish. And some schools taught Yiddish well, others not so much. I mean, there are different, the, I mean, people remember that differently, but these were secular state schools with the same overall curriculum, yeah? Okay, so that, that may be the, the background of assimilation, but, but there are also families. There are family contacts abroad, including Israel. There are uh, different uh, cultural attachments by parents. So I think that the, the picture is more complicated than, than just saying, oh, the Jews were, were assimilated, because then we would really have to be very careful and very detailed about what assimilation means. Mm -hmm. And if we take some, I don't know, theories of assimilation, some of them point also to this, the, 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 the attitude of the majority society that uh, one can fully assimilate if there is absence of prejudice and discrimination on the part of the majority society. And that was certainly not the case. Yeah, so uh, I, I think nobody really analyzes assimilation uh, from these two perspectives, but, but if you take it mm -hmm. more structurally, then my answer would be, well, no, that there was no complete assimilation precisely because uh, the, the, the majority society, or at least certain sectors in this society, maybe, maybe the majority sectors in the society, wouldn't let the Jews assimilate, whatever that means, I guess. Hmm. 
I don't know. Was there anything uh, unclear, maybe regarding the context of the campaign that I could clarify? Can I ask you a little about Bauman's own biography and his own development? Um, I try to I try to answer, but uh, I'm not that much of an expert on Bauman's biography. I read both biographies, but they they are full of detail. <laughs> well, I mean, in particular, there's this. I mean, so Bauman became a sociologist under the communist system. Um, yes, du during Stalinism, I would say. Yeah. In the 50s. Which yeah. also is interesting, actually, the, the comment you made about that he wondered if, uh, was it if 68 had uh, kind of heralded the end of sociology and perhaps it ended, it did herald the end of the kind of sociology that he was brought up with. Um, so he, 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 he rose to prominence as an intellectual and as a sociologist under that system. And he was part of the system. He was, uh, uh, with, he, he had a role within the state security apparatus, right? Yes, and uh, in this late eighties interview, uh, the homecoming interview, he acknowledges that, uh, well, at least implicitly, uh, I would say, well, he, he said that for him, well, well maybe not 1968 uh, immediately, but it opened a process for him to rethink uh, what sociology is about or what, what it should be about. And uh, in that interview, he says that, yeah, the, the, the style of sociology that he was brought up on uh, was meant to serve the social engineering, yeah, creating a new society. Oh, right. Uh, right. Really, the gardening culture that he... The gardening culture, the gardening culture. And that uh, the experience of 1968 for him uh, signaled that, well, that's as degenerated as this sociological style can become. So he turned more towards, uh, okay, intellectual as an interpreter, but also as someone who uh, fosters a critical reflection in the service of freedom. Not, not social engineering, but, 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 but freedom. Yeah. And, and yes, and, and this, this is really, uh, I think the content of his book, uh, Legislators and Interpreters from 1987. Mm. So, so that's already this, the, 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 this period, may, maybe mm. the beginning of his postmodern period, so to speak. Uh, Susan, uh, in the chat, can I persuade you to come and um, ask your question? Because I think it's actually a really interesting um, point. Shall I read the question? Um, so the, the the question is about anti-Zionism, actually. Uh, I think yeah. um, that uh, Bauman himself remained a kind of um, uh, what one might call a critic of Zionism. Um, but I wonder if he contextualized his criticism of Zionism in the anti-Zionism that had passed him out of, of, of a whole society and that he obviously had experienced as something really quite hostile. And I, I suspect Susan is, um, is uh, saying that he was rather quiet on that aspect. Um, I, I mean, I was just wondering whether he transferred that analysis of what happened to him in his generation in Poland um, in, in that under the framework of anti-Zionism, you know, did that come up again later on in his life in Britain when other 
you know, similar types of anti-Zionism, mm -hmm. but develop, but in the British context or different different context or a different time. I don't know of any text by Bauman where he would address more contemporary anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism. Uh, he himself, well, he lived, well, he emigrated to Israel from Poland and he, uh, mm. he got there in July 1968 and I think early in 1971, he moved to Leeds uh, in the UK. Mm. And in again, in this interview, the homecoming interview, he provides a kind of a rationalization for leaving Israel. And he makes this remark that, uh, well, I became a victim of one nationalism and I did, that was Polish nationalism. And I didn't want to contribute to another nationalism. And by that he meant uh, Israeli nationalism. Uh, when in Israel, uh, he wrote an article that was published, I think, in Haaretz in 1970, uh, that was titled, Israel Must Prepare for Peace. I don't know this article, uh, but it was basically from the position of peace movements, anti-occupation anti movement. Uh, that some people criticize him for. But uh, whether he, well, in his later years, I think around 2011, maybe, uh, he wrote, or maybe that was an interview where he, where he compared the, uh, the security wall in Israel to the Warsaw Ghetto Wall. That was this, the, 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 the famous interview. He was also criticized for that, but that was pretty much his position yeah. on, on, it's on, on Israel. It's but, but on, but on anti-Zionism as, uh, as a movement or ideology stigmatizing Jews, uh, no. And even in these early writings, as I said, he does not problematize uh, the anti-Zionist aspect. Yeah. It's he, an interesting he uses the term. He it, uses it, the term. Uh, he, he uses the, this expression Zionist bogey. I don't know if I if, if I pronounce it well. Zionist, Zionist bo bogey. Yeah. 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 That's as, as, as far as he goes. Uh, what does that mean? That's it's like uh, I don't know a kind of a specter, like right. a fantasy or, or, or about Zionists, uh, it's a, the, the, the code word or maybe a pretext, uh, uh, as Susan writes, uh, but that's, that, that's all. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, in recent years, we, we, we have a really good research. Uh, there are researchers in Poland. Uh, um, there's a book by, by historian Bożena Szajnok about Poland-Israel relationships between Actually, before the creation of, of Israel, uh, so that's 1944 to 1968. Mm -hmm. And there's a very, uh, very rich uh, archival uh, research presented there on, on the complexities of the relationships uh, of the attempts uh, by the Israeli diplomacy to establish better relations with Poland than uh, the, the, the reactions of the Soviet Union and so on. Uh, there's a lot really to discuss in this context. Also, um, the position of Jewish uh, of Jewish community, uh, especially in 1967, because I, I focused mostly on 1968 because that's what that's what uh, Bauman wrote about. But uh, 1967 is is extremely important because mm -hmm. the, because of the breaking of uh, breaking of the diplomatic ties. Uh, with Israel and also that's when the campaign really starts and it's uh, from the book I, ju I just mentioned is, uh, that I learned for example that there were cases that there, there was a, there's at least one case of a married couple they were mm. um, the, the husband was of Jewish descent 
he didn't even consider himself Jewish and his wife uh, was Polish, not uh, non-Jewish Pole. They were invigilated, they were harassed uh, and pressed uh, on their supposed ties to Israel or Zionist sympath sympathies and they both committed suicide in early 19, before the March 1968 campaign. Uh, she, she worked for a, uh, I think for a hospital uh, of the Ministry of Defense and he was, uh, he was employed in the military and they, they couldn't stand the atmosphere before the March 68 campaign in January 68. They both committed suicide. He was actually rescued, but that, that's, that, that's dramatic. That's uh, where well, people were discharged from the army. Uh, that, well, the, as for the Jewish institutions, like, there was this major newspaper, in fact, the only newspaper at the time that was published in Yiddish and, and with a section in Polish, it, it was called Volksstimme. Uh, and uh, the editor in chief was actually discharged. Uh, he was fired in 1968, but it was because he, was very reluctant to publish any material criticizing Israel in 1967. Well, the, the newspaper actually published su such materials because they had to, uh, and any material that was published was undergoing censorship. That, that, that's another mode of control. But uh, the Jewish community, uh, the, 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 the representatives, of, especially of the secular Social Cultural Association for the Jews, and many of them were members of the Communist Party, they were uh, either very reluctant uh, or, or they were openly critical about the government's campaign. Uh, in Wrocław, for example, the, the, uh, in 1967, the Jewish Association advised university students that, that were associated with the organization that they should express solidarity with Polish students wherever they support, whenever they support the line of the government, because otherwise they can fail their exams if they if they show their sympathy uh, towards I Israel. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, really the the, the, the anti-Semitic campaign started in June 1967. Um. Susan, did you want to... Uh... Oh, there's a question, if I may address uh, about Bauman's analysis of totalitarianism. Yes, I was just going to ask uh, if Susan wanted to uh, articulate that or to, or you can just come in on it if you... Go on, Susan. I, I, I know that he drew um, quite a lot of his... his well, I know that he drew on the work of, of um, Hannah Arendt, and I, I'm I just curious what, what what sort of intersecting points <laughs> with that, and also more generally, just you know, in what sense did he have an understanding of a, of of a problem a problem being framed as totalitarianism? I, I would say he he used the term that much. I don't recall, yes, I, I certainly recall the uh, references to Arendt in the Modernity and the Holocaust book. Uh, I would say that, uh, again, may, maybe like with the, yeah. with the concept of allosemitism, he used the concept of garden culture as a broader framework of modernity and especially nation state, but uh, not being specific about totalitarianism. Mm. But he didn't. Uh, there's a reason, isn't there, that he that he couldn't use the term totalitarianism, and the reason is that he thought that um, uh, democracy, that that Western states um, were uh, modern and therefore were totalitarian. If, if modernity is what creates totalitarianism, then you lose the distinction between totalitarian and non-totalitarian modernity is that not yeah 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 although i think that, that there are references in uh, modernity and the holocaust to other um, yeah other atrocities uh, i would say i think he mentions gulag uh the 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 the, 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 the yeah. soviet system 
And he also mentions at some point Hiroshima, for example. Yeah. So that that would be, the, these would be his comparisons, maybe more within the framework of, of, of genocide rather than, uh, than totalitarianism. Now he was, uh, the question by, by Susan is, uh, was he saying that there is no difference? Uh, yeah, he, he basically said that these are uh, manifestations of the same logic yeah. Of, yeah. of modernity at, at, ex, at, at its extremes, or at least certain aspects of modernity at, at, at their extremes. It's the, what does he say? It's the, the normal everyday elements of modernity, which just get reconfigured in a different way so that he explains Nazism and the Holocaust, not in terms of some kind of satanic great fury, but in terms of the normal functioning of, of, of modernity. So I think, and I mean, it seems, it's always struck me as likely, I don't know if this is really unfair, but you know, this is a guy who was complicit in totalitarianism in Poland and who then got spat out by totalitarianism in Poland. And he comes to, to the West and he says, oh, look, Israel is the same. I don't want to just join another nationalism, which would be the same as that nationalism. And Hiroshima is the same as the Holocaust and everything's the same as everything. But it's all in the past now because now... Everything's good because we can go to a, a lovely postmodern future everywhere. And so we don't really have to make an accounting for what we might have done or what we might have participated in or for, for the specific formations of, uh, of totalitarianism as being different from others. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe to 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 defend Bauman uh, in the context of of modernity in the Holocaust book, uh, which relates also to my presentation. I, I I'm just wondering. Uh, I'm curious what what you think. Uh, mm, I think his notion of the conceptual Jew that he uses there, because th th there are two ex quite extensive chapters on anti-Semitism, and the way he introduces, uh, I mean, how he introduces this category of the conceptual Jew. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, that's the, the English term there. I think that that might actually be more useful than allosemitism to discuss, for example, uh, the, the multi-layered anti-Semitism in Poland in 1968, that it was anti-Zionist, but it also was about historical politics, the narr narrating history, uh, it was also about uh, drawing on pre-World War II nationalistic uh, patterns. Uh, so, and the demonization of the Jews in 1968 was also that, that there is the, the Zionist plot uh, or international plot, there is cosmopolitanism, but there's also nationalism that, that is zionism so I, I think that that's his intention in introducing this notion of co conceptual jew there, there's no maybe no big theory behind it but but maybe as some heuristic device it, it, it's somehow useful i would say <clears throat> can i add something to this discussion about totalitarianism Yes, please <laughs> tell me more than welcome. <laughs> I mean, um, I also would like to defend a bit, um, or maybe um, explain how I understand the, the fact that Bauman didn't uh, refer to, uh, to totalitarianism. Um, I think it's also uh, it's, it's somehow connected with the fact how the term totalitarianism um 
functions in uh, in political in, in this historical politics in Poland or in Poland in Poland in general and I would say that the the career of the term totalitarianism in Poland also even before 1989 before the transformation is very much related to the fact to, to this to this ideology of equation of of uh, Nazism and communism and the equation of Nazism and communism in Poland the stake of this equation is is relativizing re relativizing Holocaust Holocaust and somehow covering the, the Holocaust with the suffering of Poles. So perhaps Bauman was quite aware of the context um, that his, his writing could, uh, could be used by. I don't know. It's just I, I'm also I must say that I am uh, quite suspicious um, uh, when I see this term totalitarianism in Polish uh, histor historical writing because it's very much involved in a lot of ideological stakes that I would like to uh, <laughs> restrain myself from. And in fact, that that raises a really interesting question that that perhaps uh, Martin or, or Anna um, or both of you might say something about the uh, the context of, of a kind of uh, right wing and, and religious um, critique of, of Bauman and um, how should should we uh, well I would say it's it's very simple that Bauman was a communist and a Jew that's that's as simple as that. That that's the the anti-Semitic trope uh, in 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 this critique. Uh, well, okay, then some critics, yeah, uh, they say it's not about his Jewishness, but about his political past. But uh, well, I remember <clears throat> this. That there was this. Uh, unfamous incident uh, in 2013 when Bauman's lecture was disrupted at the University of Wrocław by far-right uh, militants, in fact a neo-fascist neo uh, group, and they were shouting, uh, among many slogans, there was something about Zionists. They, they, they had some anti-communist signs with them, some banners, but also there were there were anti-Jewish slogans. They, 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 they shouted about Zionists. Yeah, that the the, the 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 Zionist will hang on the trees instead of leaves. That that that's a that's a common phrase of the far right. They usually put communists there, but but at the time they they interchangeably uh, used communists and Zionists. I don't know, Anna, maybe you have more sophisticated response. No, no, I just, maybe I would just only add that after this <laughs> incident, let's say, Bauman decided to uh, uh, not visit Poland anymore. Like he, he, he was, um, afterwards, he constantly and consequently refused to, to come to Poland. Um, yeah, which, um, and also there, uh, there was also another incident, as far as I remember, that he uh, was going to get uh, this uh, doctorate honoris causa in one of the universities in Poland, and then it was also cancelled because of the protests of the, of the far right. No, 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 no. The, the, it was not okay. cancelled, it was, it was at my university. Uh, okay, so he, uh, he, he got it, was, it, it was voted twice, and it was it was uh, voted positively. Uh, Bauman just didn't want any ceremony, and 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 he didn't want to receive the the honorary doctorate because he said, uh, "Well, I don't want any more trouble." No, no, but but it was not cancelled. Mm -hmm. So so formally he he he's he can be considered. I mean, there was no ceremony, but 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 formally the the, the vote was positive. By yeah, the I, I think it's really like uh, it, it's 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 important to remember that or to be aware that it's not the case of the fact that he it's not a, it's not because he was a communist it's because he was Jewish communist I mean there are so many officials and public intellectuals who were involved in uh, socialism communism or, or uh, um, um, Poland's public 
PRL, how do you translate it into English? The People Republic, People People's Republic of Republic Poland. Of Poland. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's not uh, something that they uh, it's not something that uh, removed them from the public sphere. But with Bauman, it's different because he was Jewish, uh, and this is the this is the case of this Jewish Bolshevism stereotype or Jewish Bolshevism Bo Jewish Bolshevism uh, uh, trope, uh, which was always chasing Bauman in Poland, and he was very much aware of that. And uh, this is why it's it's something that you like it. When you when you say something when you when you think about Bauman uh, as as communist uh, um, as a communist activist or a person who was involved in communism, uh, the perception of Bauman is always uh, uh, tangled with the fact that he was Jewish. In this case, yes, and also, uh, and I maybe I didn't articulate that uh, well enough in in my presentation. But in the 60s, uh, there was this distinction between the national communists, especially this, this, this partisans faction, and those who uh, spent the war in the Soviet Union, or most of the war, and then they came with the Soviet mm -hmm. army and the Polish army that was uh, organized by the Soviets. And Bauman was, was one, one of these people. And uh, so, so, so the first group were national communists like national socialists yeah that they were basically they were basically nationalists uh and i don't know that that was the distinction about uh anyone who was in the soviet union there was there were also non-jews but in fact uh many jews escaped the, the nazi occup occupation to the soviet union and when they came they came back from the soviet union so so they were associated with the Soviet Union more, as opposed to mm -hmm. those who were involved in the in the anti-Nazi underground uh, in the occupied Poland, in Nazi-occupied Poland. Wow, brilliant! Um... I hope that all these complexities of po Poland's history are are clear, or at least clear enough for the participants yeah, yeah. tonight. And really interesting, really interesting. I mean, it's not obvious that that, that someone involved in the Polish sort of underground and, and, and therefore in some kind of Polish nationalism is worse than somebody involved in Soviet nationalism or Soviet uh, uh, universalism. Anyway, listen, I... I um sorry i shouldn't have taken the last word in that way um if people if there's no more questions i th i think uh, that was a very very rich um talk and i want to thank you very much for it um actually i should mention in particular that uh, you're talking from rosla uh which um is the town that my mum was from actually in uh, which was at the time a german town um so that's quite a nice moment for me actually um let me give you uh our website of the london center for the study of contemporary antisemitism and this is the website to which you can donate if you would like to pay what you might have paid to participate um and to hear uh martin's brilliant uh lecture and i want to thank martin and i want to thank everybody who uh came well, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it was a great pleasure.